How does your diet today affect your multiple sclerosis symptoms years down the line? Perhaps you've heard of Professor George Jelinek, author of Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis. He claims that a whole foods, plant-based diet plus seafood may reduce multiple sclerosis severity on the average. And he and his team at University of Melbourne have published various cross-sectional studies showing that people who follow this diet more closely tend to do better on average. But recently, his team has published a new paper which looks prospectively and looks at how people's diet affects their level of disability and other symptoms 7.5 years later. I give credit to first author, neuroepidemiologist, Dr. Steve Simpson, and senior author, Dr. Sandra Neat. Let's have some fun. I'll start with a conflict of interest statement. I do know the authors of this study, and I was the author of chapter one of Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis Handbook, and I do have plans of an ongoing research project with the University of Melbourne and these individuals, so you're welcome to accuse me of bias and disregard this video, but let's take a look at the data anyway. So this study used the Holism data set, which stands for Health Outcomes and Lifestyle in a Sample of Individuals with MS, and they originally recruited these people in 2012, and they were all around the world with all different diet types. Now originally they had close to 2,500 subjects but only 948 actually completed all the surveys so there was relatively poor attrition and that's one potential criticism of this study. It could be biased just because most people didn't really follow all the way to the end. They surveyed people every 2.5 years and they used a self-reported diet questionnaire called the DHQ. To take a closer look at the DHQ it asked questions about cereals, fruit and vegetable intake, takeaway foods, which is takeout food or fast food, fat intake, fiber, and individual food choices such as meat and dairy. And for the purposes of this study, meat really refers to beef and red meat. It does not refer to poultry or fish. And they also looked at food preparation practices such as frying food. And the outcomes were primarily disability, but also some other outcomes as we'll see. And of course, this study is done by neuroepidemiologists, not neurologists. And so they didn't actually examine patients and check the EDSS. They used a patient reported MS severity scale called the PMSSS, but this has been validated and is reasonably accurate and correlates somewhat with the EDSS. And roughly speaking, mild disability is 0 to 3, moderate is 3 to 6, and severe disability is greater than 6. They also looked at fatigue using the fatigue severity scale, FSS, and depression using the PHQ2, and a quality of life index used in multiple sclerosis called the MSQOL54, which measures both physical and mental quality of life. Now the methodology they used was a little bit obtuse. So one way to do this study would be to look at a factor such as dairy and correlate it with the outcome. But the problem is that multiple sclerosis is so variable and there's so many factors contributing to things like disability and fatigue that they decided to adjust for various other factors using multinomial logistic regression for polychromatous terms and they adjusted for things like recent relapses, age, sex, MS phenotype, relapsing versus progressive MS, fatigue, socioeconomic status and of course baseline level of disability at the beginning of the study. If you were less disabled at the beginning you're probably going to be less disabled later on. They also used what's known as a two-tailed t-test. This is where you make no presumption about the direction of the effect. For instance dairy is it going to be beneficial not beneficial. Instead of a one-tailed t-test where they might presume that dairy is harmful to people with MS they made no presumptions just let the data do the talking and this has the effect of making the p-values somewhat higher. So when you see a statistically significant result, it really is significant. The problem with this data is you get a really weird outcome. You get an r-value, a correlation coefficient. So an r-value of 0 would be no correlation. An r-value of 1 would be a 100% correlation. In the real world, for studies like this, you're looking for r-values between 0.3 and 0.7. But it's very difficult to know what to make of this result and the significance of it. And of course, there could be unknown confounders. This is definitely not a randomized trial, so take everything here with a grain of salt. And just to show you what this sort of data looks like, let's look back at the prior cross-sectional study of the Holism data set. So they asked people, at one point in time, do you consume meat, yes or no? Again, this is beef, not poultry or fish. And does it correlate with the patient-determined multiple sclerosis severity score? And it, in fact, does with a correlation coefficient of 0.54 and a p-value 
value less than 0.001. And again, they corrected for various factors. People consuming meat tended to be more disabled. This was also true with dairy with a correlation coefficient of 0.35 and a p-value of 0.001. So we'll see, does this hold up prospectively over 7.5 years? But first, let's take a look at the people in the study. So this was a mostly female study with 80.2% of participants being women, which makes sense because about 75% of people with MS overall are women. It was a relatively well-educated group with 33.6% having a postgraduate degree and relatively high in socioeconomic status with 53.8% saying they were above average income, 30.3% saying around average income, and 15.9% saying below average income we can see that a decent percentage did not consume meat. And you can see here that a lot of the people who got into the study were actually following the overcoming multiple sclerosis diet. 58.9% saying they consume meat and 41.1% saying they were not consuming meat. Again, meat here refers to beef and other red meat, not to poultry and fish. And you can see this is probably much different than the general population with most people at least consuming some red meat. Same thing is true with dairy with 52.4% saying they consume dairy, but 47.6% who did not consume dairy. In terms of weight, 56.2% were normal weight or underweight, 25.3% were overweight, and the remaining were obese. In terms of multiple sclerosis type, the majority had relapsing multiple sclerosis with 72.5% with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis or benign MS, 8.5% with secondary progressive MS, and 6.1% with primary progressive MS and some without a specific subtype reported. In terms of their baseline severity, you can see that 65.9% had mild symptoms at the beginning of the study prior to the 7.5 years, 22.1% had moderate severity, and 12.0% had severe disability. You can see that a significant amount did have clinically significant fatigue, 41%. And in terms of depression, 13.8% had depression. The average age in the study was 52.8. And you can see their baseline scores on the physical and mental quality of life scores. And the average person had multiple sclerosis for 18.1 years. And so people in this study were relatively older and had MS for a significant period of time, which is good if you're looking at out long-term outcomes of lifestyle factors. Now we move to the results, and it's a really difficult to interpret their data because the formatting is terrible and the data don't line up at all, but I'll explain to you what you're looking at. This compares the diet health quality survey, the overall score with physical quality of life, the physical component of the MSQOL 54 survey. Survey. So on the left-hand side, you'd see the DHQ score higher being better, and it ranges from 39 to 100. And then you see a correlation coefficient comparing that group to the lowest score. So here, the correlation coefficient is zero because it's comparing the 39 to 72 group to itself. The next line shows a correlation coefficient of 0.11, which compares the 72 to 81 score group to the 39 to 72 score group. And you can see there's a very low correlation. However, if you look at the 81 to 89 score group and the 89 to 100 score group, there are relatively high correlations of 0.65 and 0.64 respectively, and you can see the confidence intervals in parentheses. The p-value you see at the bottom is the p-value for the overall trend. Is there a correlation overall between higher score on the DHQ survey and physical quality of life? The answer is yes. Yes, people with higher scores tend to have higher physical quality of life with a p-value of 0.002. Next, we look at the same thing, the DHQ, and comparing it to mental quality of life surveys. And there was actually no statistically significant difference. There was a slight trend here. You can see a correlation coefficient of 0.2 comparing the high scoring group to the lowest scoring group, but no statistically significant difference. Now we move to the individual components. First, let's look at fruit and vegetable consumption. Do people who eat more fruits and vegetables do better? The answer is yes. And the effect is much stronger for physical quality of life than for mental health quality of life. Let's look at the highest fruit and vegetable consuming group versus the lowest. You can see a correlation coefficient of 0.65 with a p-value of 
0.012. Comparing it to mental health quality of life, the correlation coefficient was 0.34. It was statistically significant, p equals 0.047, but kind of on the low end of what would be considered to be clinically meaningful. Next, we'll look at takeaway foods or takeout or fast food. And here it's a little bit confusing because a higher score refers to consuming less fast food and snacks. And you can see there was a correlation coefficient of 0.66 and 0.64 for the physical and mental health quality of life surveys. So consuming less takeout food seems to be good and they were both statistically significant. Interestingly, there was another similar study on MS that found almost the opposite effect. I'm not sure why two different surveys had different results. Next, they looked at fat consumption and here a higher score refers to less fat consumption and they found a very strong effect looking at the physical quality of life score with a correlation coefficient of 0.81 comparing the highest score to the lowest score and that was statistically significant but for mental health quality of life there was a slight trend correlation coefficient of 0.28 but it was not statistically significant. They also looked at fiber and higher fiber consumption associated with better physical health quality of life with a correlation coefficient of 0.49 and a p-value of 0.026. For the mental health quality of life, there was no statistically significant difference, but there was a trend with a correlation coefficient of 0.3 such that higher fiber tended to associate with better mental health quality of life. They also looked at meat and dairy, and sure enough, this prospective study did in fact recapitulate the prior results. Results. So they just asked, do you consume meat? Yes or no. And here you see a negative correlation coefficient of negative 0.39 with people consuming meat doing worse. And this was statistically significant p-value 0.023. However, it was not statistically significant for mental health quality of life. So for whatever reason, it was just harder for them to demonstrate any mental health benefits, perhaps because there are just too many factors that come into play in the way that people fill out those surveys. Whereas the physical quality of life outcomes seem to be more associated with diet for whatever reason. Same was true with dairy consumption, where they asked, do you consume dairy? Yes or no. And those who consume dairy definitely did worse on the average with a correlation coefficient of minus 0.51, p-value of 0.063, but nothing statistically significant, excuse me, it was statistically significant for mental health quality of life for dairy with a correlation coefficient of minus 0.41 with a p-value of 0.015. So the overall summary of the results is people tended to do better if they had a better overall diet, higher overall DHQ score, if they avoided meat and dairy, and if they consumed more fiber and avoided takeout food and consumed less fat. So I made a lot of criticisms of the methodology of the study. Hey, maybe the investigators are biased. Maybe the participants are biased. What exactly does a correlation coefficient of 0.4 for mean if I can't even look at the scatter plot. It's just sort of a theoretical correlation coefficient. But that being said, there does seem to be this overall trend between people having certain dietary habits and better prognosis of MS. And this isn't exactly like taking a drug with specific significant side effects. You have to eat something. Something has to go in your mouth and it may as well be something that's correlated with better prognosis in MS and you can't really go wrong eating broccoli. Now is the overall overcoming multiple sclerosis diet, whole foods, plant-based diet, plus seafood better than say the Walls protocol or the Swank diet or the paleo diet or whatever else it might be. I have no idea, but you have to eat something. You may as well choose something healthy. And this is reasonable evidence, I would say, given the extremely low risk of the diet. And again, you have to eat something. And even if it does nothing for MS, maybe you'll prevent a heart attack or a stroke down the road. So I'd be interesting to know, do you follow the overcoming multiple sclerosis protocol? How strictly do you follow it? And what are your results? I also mentioned we have some ongoing research to look at nutrition in multiple sclerosis, and you'll find more out about that at a later time. If you have any suggestions for future videos or other comments, please post below.